Welcome back to Prions on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to discuss the prion disease known as classical creutzfeldt jakob disease. As you might guess, in this playlist, we're going to be discussing the various prion diseases. We'll start with this one in this video, which is called Classophil Creutzfeldt Jakob disease, uh, also called CJD. And in the next two videos, we're going to follow this up with variations of CJD. The first one we're going to talk about is Kuru, uh, which you can see is caused by eating brains of those affected with CJD. And then after that, we'll talk about variant creutzfeldt jakob disease, which is the human form of mad cow disease. And really, in all three of these diseases, um, the protein that misfolds is denoted prion protein with this uh, C subscript. Okay, This is the form of the protein that has not yet misfolded. And so humans, cows, pretty much mammals in general, as we would expect, express this protein. And normally it's just called prion protein. But again, this capital C is to denote that it's the correctly folded protein. In this form over here, this is called prion protein SC. And the SCS actually is an abbreviation for scrapies, which is a prion disease observed in sheep, uh, but this SC denotes the misfolded form of this protein. And in classophil creutzfeldt jakob disease, uh, the prion protein specifically is the protein that's going to um, be the culprit in the disease, and as a result of it being the initial prion disease that was discovered, the gene encoding this protein is given the name prion protein. So we have this protein right here, prion protein. Notice that it has a high degree of alpha helices relative to beta strands. Um, this is normal in the correctly folded form of the protein. However, what we see is through the process of misfolding, we get a different conformer of the prion protein. So these are the same protein, they're just different conformers, meaning they have different conformations. And this conformation over here, where we now have a higher degree of beta strands, this is a consequence of this misfolding. And as we've mentioned in the introductory video to the prion playlist, it's these beta strands and high degree of them that allows these prion proteins, at least in this form, to aggregate as shown over here. Now, the initial misfolding is only contributed 8% from genetics. Uh, most of the cases are actually sporadic misfolding, and this misfolding, at least in the classical form of this disease, normally occurs later in life with a mean age of approximately 60 to 65. So this is going to happen with age. Only 8% of these uh, misfoldings are due to genetic mutations or polymorphisms. But when you do have the misfolding, you get this form of the protein, which now has these beta strands that are going to allow them to stack on top of one another and aggregate in a manner such as this. Um, one of the analogies I used um, in the introductory video is if we think about the correctly folded protein, which this is an example of a correctly folded protein, as you note the high degree of alpha helices, it's kind of like a chair that's folded out like this that you could sit in. If I tried to stack a bunch of these chairs in this form on top of each other, I'm not going to get very far because uh, those chairs are going to fall apart. They're not going to stack very well. However, if I fold up the chair, so I change the conformation of the chair to this flat form like you see here in the right picture, now it's very easy to stack these chairs one on top of another. In fact, this is actually how you store these folding chairs. This represents, or each one of these I should say, represent the prion misfolded form of the protein. And then as you can see here, you can stack them very similar to the way that these proteins are actually going to aggregate, as shown right here. And so the aggregation occurs, and you get these long stacks of prion proteins. And not only can these uh, stack with themselves, but they can actually induce uh, other proteins to adhere to them as well. Overall, you just get propagation of this stacking, of this aggregation. It's going to occur in a chain reaction type of manner. And eventually, you're just going to have a lot of these aggregations, which typically we denote plaques. And they cause all sorts of problems for cells. In general, it's going to mainly affect the nervous system, the central nervous system that is, and it's going to cause neuronal dysfunction and cell death. Now, uh, first of all, let's talk about the, the general mechanisms of why this occurs, which is pretty much going to be very similar 
Uh, between all prion diseases, uh, there are going to be some minor differences. But some of the things that are known to happen is these uh, proteins can actually insert themselves into membranes, and they will actually drastically increase the calcium influx into cells. And that's going to cause cytotoxicity, mitochondrial dysfunction, and because of that mitochondrial dysfunction, it will induce apoptosis of the cells. And so we get cell death in uh, normally specific areas of the brain. For example, the Kuru form of this disease, as we'll find in the next video, mainly targets the cerebellum for destruction. Um, other diseases such as Parkinson's disease affect the substantia nigra. Uh, this is one uh, prion disease that really just generally affects the brain, um, but it will affect uh, in a large part the cerebral cortex, and it will also involve uh, so several components of the motor system, of motor systems that is of the brain. And when you get this cell death, uh, notice what happens is you get these lesions. These actually lesions that look like the texture of Swiss cheese, um, or we could say a sponge, if you actually look at a kitchen sponge, these are actually lesions where the cells have actually died, where the neurons have died, and so we would say it gets a sponge-like appearance. And so for that reason, uh, many of these diseases, in particular the three we're going to discuss, including this one, uh, Kuru and the variant form, these are called spongiform diseases, or spongiform encephalopathies, because they result in parts of the brain having a sponge-like appearance. And when these neurons die, ultimately you get several changes. In the early stages of class creutzfeldt jakob disease, the individual is going to suffer memory problems, behavior changes, poor coordination, and visual disturbances. And then later in life, they're going to have much more severe memory problems such as dementia, things that are going to resemble Alzheimer's disease. It is not Alzheimer's, but it will resemble it. And then involuntary movements, blindness, weakness, and coma. Um, the involuntary movements are mainly going to result because not only will this affect the cortex of the brain or regions of it, it will also affect the cerebellum. But with any of these prion diseases, including this one, the ultimate result is going to be fatal. It's going to result in the death of the individual, unfortunately. And with any prion disease, there is no cure. Uh, there's no way to reverse it. Uh, there are, in some prion diseases, ways to slow it down. But one of the uh, terrible things about this uh, prion disease is that it's fatal usually within about a year the per, uh, or less in some cases. Uh, once you get this, it's pretty much a quick road and the individual is going to die, unfortunately. Okay. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to mention about this disease um, that's going to be important when we start talking about Kuru and also mad cow disease. As I mentioned earlier, pretty much every mammal, including humans and cows, express this protein, which is encoded by the PRPN gene, which is the prion protein. As I mentioned, this form of the prion protein, which is the healthy, non-infectious form, uh, this is susceptible to intestinal and stomach hydrolysis. So, in the stomach, the stomach acid would be able to denature this protein, and then pepsin in the stomach, which is a proteolytic enzyme, and also the small intestine, trypsins and chymotrypsins, etc., they would be able to proteolyze this protein and get rid of it. Okay, So it would just be like any other dietary protein. However, when this protein misfolds into the infectious form, PRPSC, and especially when it aggregates, such as this over here on the right, then that resulting aggregation is incredibly resistant now to the acid in the stomach and then all of the GI enzymes that would normally be able to degrade proteins. And so what can happen is this protein can then wind up being absorbed. It will survive the small intestine. It will be absorbed into the blood, transported to the central nervous system where it can then wind up inside neurons of your brain. And once this is in the neurons of your brain, it will continue aggregating there and continue propagating in a chain reaction like fashion. And pretty much you can get all the same stuff that we just talked about in classical creutzfeldt jakob disease. And I really talk about consuming the misfolded form of this prion protein and its aggregates really for one main reason. It's really important to remember that the classical form of creutzfeldt jakob disease this is not something that happens when you consume proteins. This does not require consumption, at least the classical form. This is really just a spontaneous, or we could say sporadic, misfolding of the protein, that is the prion protein, into an infectious form. So this does not require any consumption. This is something that is happening intrinsically in the central nervous system of the affected individual. Okay? This does not require consuming the protein. However, 
What we're going to see in the next two videos is there are diseases that are very similar to, they're more or less kind of like you could say quote unquote isoforms of classical Creutzfeldt Jakob disease that do occur whenever you consume that aggregated prion protein as shown right here. One case is called Kuru. We're going to talk about that in the next video. This is actually a disease that's caused by eating the brain of an individual with Creutzfeldt Jakob disease. Okay. Um, now, obviously, most people don't eat brains. This is pretty much confined to some indigenous tribes on Papua New Guinea, which is a Pacific island. So we'll talk about that in the next video. And then after that, we'll talk about what's called variant Creutzfeldt Jakob disease. This is the human form of mad cow disease. So while Kuru is going to occur, as we'll see, because you eat a human that had Creutzfeldt Jakob disease, variant Creutzfeldt Jakob disease is going to occur because you ate a a cow that had mad cow disease, which is the human equivalent of Creutzfeldt Jakob disease. So we'll talk about more, more of those in the next couple of videos. But in any case, hopefully you learned a little bit of something about classical Creutzfeldt Jakob disease and how it's really just an intrinsic misfolding of the prion protein and does not require an extraneous source of this misfolded prion protein and its aggregates. But ultimately, it will result, unfortunately, in death of the individual. All right, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.